I'd like to talk to you today about big data. It's a term we've probably all heard a lot recently. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about it, though, is that it seems to mean very different things to different people. Some people, when they hear the term big data, they think of money. They think about how it can be used by companies to design products more efficiently and market them more effectively. Other people, when they hear the term big data, they think about saving the world. They think about how governments and NGOs can use this new kind of information to help solve important social problems. Some other people, though, when they hear the term big data, they think of surveillance. They think about all the enormous amounts of potentially very sensitive information that's being collected about all of us all the time. But for me, when I think about big data, I think about something different. I think about a urinal. So this, though, as you all recognize, is not just any urinal. This is a very, very special urinal. This is Fountain by Duchamp. This is one of my favorite pieces of art. And what I love about this is the way that Duchamp took something that was created for one purpose and then repurposed it for something else. And it turns out that this idea of repurposing is central to the way that scientists learn from big data. Because most of the big data sources that exist were created by companies and governments for reasons other than doing research. And so scientists have to take data that was created for one purpose and, like Duchamp, repurpose it for something else. And this is actually really different than the way social scientists have gone about learning about the world in the past. And if I had to pick one piece of art that could illustrate the sort of more traditional style of social science research, it would be David. So when Michelangelo wanted to create David, he didn't look around for a piece of stone that kind of sort of looked like David. He spent three years working to create David. And so this illustrates really the two styles of research that we see right now. There is a ready-made style where researchers, Duchamp-like, take data that was created, let's say, by Twitter or Facebook and repurpose it for research. And then there's the other style where researchers create their own data using like surveys or experiments. But increasingly, what we're going to see is that there are limits to both of these pure approaches. The Duchamps will discover that there are things that you can't learn just by repurposing data. And the Michelangelo's will increasingly feel like they're being inefficient and wasteful by not taking advantage of all the ready-made big data that exists. So I think the future of social research is a hybrid of these two strategies. It's going to be part ready-made and part custom-made, and that's going to allow us to do things that we could never do before with either of these pure strategies. So let me give you an example of a beautiful piece of research that illustrates this hybrid strategy. This is a study that was conducted by Josh Blumenstock and colleagues, and it was published in Science a few years ago. Before I tell you about what they did, let me tell you a little bit about the problem they were trying to solve. Let's say you want to eliminate poverty in the world. So that's a goal that I think many of us would share. Uh, but one of the many, many, many problems you would encounter on the way to that goal is that it's actually hard to know where poverty is and how poverty is changing over time. Now this may be kind of a surprising thing for people in wealthy countries because we happen to live in countries where, for example, in the US, the national statistical system collects reliable and accurate information about our society. But in many of the world's poorest countries where this information is most needed, it's not collected. And so this is a challenge for policymakers because they're essentially trying to operate in the dark. They, they can't know where the problem is, which makes it hard to target the resources effectively. And it's hard to see how well they're doing because they can't measure the outcomes. And so many, many people have worked on the problem of improving measurement of poverty. But Josh Blumenstock and colleagues took a different approach. So what they did is they started with the call records from the largest mobile phone provider in Rwanda. So this was 1.5 million customers. And they have very detailed records about the patterns of calling and texting for all of these people. But these ready-made call records do not have the thing that the research actually cared about, which is a measure of poverty. And so what they did is they took a sample, a random sample from these uh, set of call records. They phoned the people up, and they gave them a traditional social science survey to measure their poverty. So they have this custom-made data set, and they have this ready-made data set. And then what I love about this study is the way that they link them up together. So let me walk you through that process now. So the first thing they did is a process called feature engineering, where they created an enormous matrix where there's one row for each person and one column for each feature. And these features could be things like number of outgoing calls, number of incoming calls, 
but they could also be much more subtle. So for example, of the people that you've called, what's the probability that they call each other? So they build many, many complicated features like this. And then they train a machine learning model to use those features to predict what people said on the survey. So for example, this machine learning model might discover that people who make more international calls tend to be more wealthy. That is an example of the kind of thing it might find. It actually finds many more subtle patterns. So once you have this machine learning model, then you can impute the survey responses for all 1.499 million other people. So impute is just a fancy social science term for guessing. And so in essence, what they've done here is by doing a survey of 1,000 people, they've been able to approximate what would happen if you did a survey of 1.5 million people. Then what they did is they estimated where everyone lived. Even though the call records did not have people's names and addresses, it turns out that what towers you make phone calls from at night is a pretty good approximation of where you lived. So here you see how they were able to connect up this ready-made call data with this custom-made survey data, and now they're able to produce high-resolution geographic estimates of poverty in Rwanda. And here's what those look like. So this is a partial map of Rwanda. I want to call attention to the square in the lower right corner. So the scale of that is one kilometer by one kilometer. And so you can see that they are able to make estimates for very, very small geographic areas, estimates that would be very helpful to policymakers. So now you may be wondering, like, are these estimates even accurate? That's the important question. And the unfortunate truth is we don't know, because no one has ever made estimates this precise before. However, what you would really like to do is you would like to be able to compare these measurements somehow to some kind of gold standard measure. And it turns out that a few years before their study, the Rwandan government conducted a demographic and health survey, which is a traditional, expensive, high-quality social survey that can reasonably be considered a gold standard. So the demographic and health survey was not able to produce estimates at this small of a geographic level, but it was able to produce estimates for the Rwanda's 30 regions. And so what Blumenstock and colleagues did is they aggregated their estimates up to these 30 regions, and they produced a map like this. So on this map, darker colors indicate higher levels of poverty. And so these are the estimates that come from this combination of the ready-made and custom-made data. And now you may be wondering, how well does this match the gold standard measure? And so here's the other estimate from the Demographic and Health Survey. And so you can see, in the paper, they actually have a lot of very detailed technical comparisons, which I'm just going to summarize as saying they match really well. So for example, you can see in the center of the countries, both approaches detect a region of high poverty, and then directly beneath that, they have a region of higher levels of wealth. So this is really exciting that this uh, new approach to measurement can reproduce this much more traditional, well-established measurement technique. But then you might be saying, well, why should we care? Like, if we already have this gold standard technique, why should we be interested in this new technique at all? And the answer is that this new technique is 10 times faster and 50 times cheaper. So 50 times cheaper, that is not like 10% cheaper, 20% cheaper. That's like 50 times cheaper. And so that makes a huge, huge difference. So that enables all kinds of new things. So let me just give you one concrete example. So instead of doing the demographic and health survey every five years, as happens now, you could do it every month. So in wealthy countries, we don't have to wait every five years to get measures of our society. We track things like the unemployment rate every month. And why should it be that people in poor countries don't have the same level of measurement as well? So that's just one example of the kind of thing that we can do when the cost drops by a factor of 50. And scientists will think of lots of other creative things that can be done as well. Now, the scientist in me also wants to clarify that this is not 100% of a fair apples to apples comparison because there are about 70 years of theoretical results and empirical know-how underlying the custom-made demographic and health survey. We know a lot about that kind of technique, and there's much less of a theoretical foundation for this new approach that combines ready-mades and custom-mades. However, learning from big data sources and figuring out how we can do it reliably is an incredibly active area of research right now, and I'm really confident that we're going to make a lot of progress in the coming years. So stepping back for a second from this study, I hope that you can see now some of the points that we talked about at the beginning. So this study is an example 
of how companies are potentially sitting on lots of valuable information that they are not currently extracting from their big data. It's also an example of how, when analyzed appropriately, big data sources can help address important social problems. And it's a reminder that enormous amounts of data are being collected about us. But what I love about this study, why I think it's so great, is because it's a beautiful example of this hybrid style. That is, the ready-made call data alone was not enough, the custom-made survey data was not enough. It was only through the combination of these two things that they were able to accomplish this goal. And so I hope that the next time you hear the phrase big data, this will be what you think of. <laughs> because this is the future of social research in the digital age. Thank you. <laughs>